Hello and welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast with your host, metaphysician, Reiki master, and hypnotherapist, Christy Clemens Hoffman. Each week, we will discover teachings, tips, and tools to radiate your best life ever with practitioners, authors, and luminaries to help you on your path. Wellness, joy, peace, abundance. What do you want to radiate? Hello and welcome back to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. Today we radiate Mary's divine love with Marguerite Rigoglioso, PhD, who is the foremost authority on the history of virgin birth and the author of the bold new book, The Mystery Tradition of Miraculous Conception, Mary and the Lineage of Virgin Births. Marguerite taught many graduate and undergraduate courses in the U.S. and the U.K., and in 2012 founded her own Seven Sisters Mystery School, through which she's been teaching about the sacred feminine and mentoring clients on the evolutionary spiritual path. She is also the author of Virgin Mother Goddesses of Antiquity and The Cult of Divine Birth in Ancient Greece. Thank you so much for joining me today, Marguerite. I've really been looking forward to this. Oh, me too. Thank you so much for having me, Christy. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And so this this notion of the virgin birth, it's not just Christian, is it? No, no. It's actually all around the world. It's in India. It's in ancient Greece. Um, really in, in ancient the ancient Roman tradition, in Native American traditions. Um, it forms the foundational story of humanity uh, coming from the Pleiades as well, the seven sisters of the Pleiades. So for star seeds and people interested in cosmic disclosure and our star allies, that's an interesting fact for people to know of. It's in the Hebrew tradition. It's in the Zoroastrian tradition. Um, you know, various traditions all over the world. That's fascinating. Um, wow, yeah, it's not just Christian, is it? So why is it that we have become so attached to the virgin birth story from Mother Mary, from the Christian tradition? Because the whole concept of virgin birth was suppressed. Um, starting in antiquity, when... Um, you know, I mean, I already in antiquity, it was it was starting to get submerged, okay, under the medical establishment. But you still see it, like in Greek antiquity, um, the the old medical practitioner Asclepius is said to have um, initiated or or facilitated some miraculous births. And it was believed to be something that could happen. Um, it was understood that it happened in ancient Egypt, that this is how the pharaohs were born and so forth. But because, because women's material always goes missing when it comes to writings and history and you know, who's, who is governing the spaces of religion, of all the institutions, it, it goes missing, women's concerns go missing, women's history goes missing. And then under patriarchy, as the idea of women's power kept getting pushed further and further down, the cons and the, and the scientism rose, rose and rose and rose, eclipsing anything having to do with mysticism, mystery traditions, and so forth, um, virgin birth essentially became an impossibility, you know, in, in medical quarters and things like that. So the place where it was retained was in the Christian enterprise, which then, of course, suppressed the previous religions, the pagan religions and the folk religions and so forth. And their story became the main story, which is the story of Mary's divine birth, even though um, in the Bible, we also find that Elizabeth, uh, her relative 
had a, had a divine birth, divinely gave birth to um, John the Baptist. And, you know, even though in, in the Hebrew tradition, we have the miraculous birth of Isaac from Sarah, but those are disappeared under the concept that, oh, these are postmenopausal women who were barren and they prayed to God and they were they got their babies that way. It's never presented as part of a priestess practice that was going on. And so that's the work that I've done to look at all of these stories of divine birth, particularly in the ancient Mediterranean world. I started my research in that way and on that topic and then when i went to look at one of the gospels that has to do with mary the suppressed gospel known as the infancy gospel of james which tells us about mary's mother her mary's conception mary's infancy toddlerhood childhood and adolescence and her birth of jesus um you know, it, I was able to read that and, and the signs and the symbols and understand from my previous research how she was part of an entire program and process of divine birth that was very widespread. So, you know, it's just way more convenient for patriarchy and for the Christian church to treat it as a kind of single soul event and anomaly um something that that you know only happened to this passive maiden in order to bring the godhead in because to look at it in any other way becomes threatening to that religious enterprise and it becomes threatening to patriarchy which which survives and thrives on women not knowing their own womb power mm -hmm. and so in studying all of these births do you feel that they are literal stories or allegorical? I do believe they are literal. And, you know, we have um, stories in the ancient Greek tradition that Plato was divinely conceived by his mother, Perictione, that Pythagoras was divinely conceived by his mother, Pythias, that Augustus Caesar was divinely conceived by his mother, Atia. You know, for, these are just some live uh, human people that Alexander the Great was divinely conceived by his mother, Olympias. So we have those historical figures and, you know, these are actual born people that, that we can, you know, we have records walk to the earth. Um, and then I find a, a mother load of information, you know, in the ancient Greek historical and mythological records and legendary records, which I also believe are accurately depicting events that took place on the planet. And, you know, yes, I mean, it was said in the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois tradition, the five and six nations that came together they came together because of the birth of the peacemaker who was divinely conceived by his mother, Deganawida. And because he had miracle capabilities like Jesus and so forth, the people listened to him and the warring factions, you know, the Huron and, you know, all these various um, tribes, Mohawk, Seneca and everything, they agreed to come together because they, they understood that this miraculous being had come forth in order to help them get to a better place. Wow. Um, have you done any research or looked into, are there, are there modern day miraculous births? Yes. Yes, we do know of several stories in this regard. One has been brought to light by a man named Den Poitras in his book, Parthenogenesis, Women's Long Lost Ability to Self-Conceive. He was very good friends with a young woman um, back in the 70s. And she um, told him that she divinely conceived through a flash of light on Christmas Eve in 1976 that she brought the child to term, that it only lived three months, and then it died, presumably because the vibration on the planet couldn't hold the baby. And um, there has been, there is, I am aware of a Hindu woman um, and her, you know, she's a, she is a teacher 
Um, and she claims to have divinely conceived by remotely um, by in her third eye. And I, I met the daughter. Um, there, there is another woman who says that she divinely conceived in Mexico and her child lived to be only three years old. So um, those, are, those are some of the ones that I know personally. I have heard you know, of, of others who, have, who were told they could, be, could divinely conceive. Um, there are other women who've been very fascinated by this process, who have a lot of past life memories. And for all we know, there could be an unbroken lineage of divine birth used for positive means. And it seems, you know, the, the information that I receive on the inner planes is that this technology has been hijacked and used for negative means to, to bring forth um, beings, people that are running the negative show on the planet. Really? So this, these divine births are not merely divine but they can be of the a darker nature too like anything in duality which is what we're in right anything of the light can be grabbed by the the negative mm -hmm. and twisted and inverted to for its own means oh my goodness and so it's thought that that, that, that these twisted rituals are potentially used um in various conception rites for royalty and things like that mm -hmm. right so these are rituals that bring about this divine birth yes so what i have what i have uncovered is that the original priestesses who used to do it the way of the light um were, had very high level yogas that they knew how to do they were trained how to do in lineages and so forth that involved um, working with, with their body, mind, spirit, working with their egg, working with the elements of earth, air, fire, water, working with the quantum level of, of DNA reproduction and the level of spirit that would be assisted through um, the use of light, the use of sound, and the presence of guardian forces masters angels and so forth that's why we see the the angel gabriel in mary's story and also her mother her mother anne who divinely conceived mary according to this suppressed gospel which is what i write about in the book you mentioned um anne was um guided by a guardian angel and these angels the functions of these angels in these two stories seems to be to tell the women when they have actually conceived that they can stop their process which metaphorically is called weaving but they they literally are like weaving a soul into their dna without the use of male sperm oh my goodness mm -hmm. yeah you see so finally you know this is coming to light now in I mean, I've been writing and talking about this material basically since my dissertation came out in 2007. Mm -hmm. And then now with, with my book um, on Mary having come out in 2021, mm -hmm. um, thinking people, spiritual people can understand this in a whole new way that bypasses all the dogma and the unbelievability of it and allows us to understand the technologies that were involved, as I like to call them. That these were high level holy women who knew what they were doing. And it was a very specialized practice. And the reason they were doing it was to bring a higher vibrational being to the planet that could not quite be born through the regular channels. One who would help humanity bring them along, help them evolve out of a stuck place and so forth. That's what the purpose of these divinely born ones seems to have been all across the board. Wow, that is so, fascinating. So Mary was one such, right. Jesus was one such, John the Baptist was one such, um, Isaac, you know, one of the 
close to the founder of, of um, the Hebrew tradition was, mm -hmm. and so forth. Right. Among many other traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the peacemaker, Zoroaster, um, Buddha has a story of a strange birth that he was born out of his mother's side. And when I, I learned that whenever there are stories of strange conceptions or strange birthings, they're always referring to some kind of divine birth right that was involved or some kind of divine conception. So it seems that there's lore about Buddha as well. Really? Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And we have this story about King Arthur. Yes. And even Merlin himself. So, you know, this is what I'm going to be talking about in my upcoming course, uh, Heal Yourself in Our World by Reclaiming Guinevere, Arthur, the Fae, and the Round Table. And that's going to be live um, starting June 15th, 2022. And then for anyone listening to this podcast, after the course is concluded, it will be available on demand at the Seven Sisters Mystery School.com website. So you see, I was able to tease that out and more from the Arthurian tradition by applying, you know, the lens that, that I had acquired by looking at all the details of divine birth, especially in ancient Greece and then in Mother Mary to the Avalon story. And it's amazing what pops up. And then it, it becomes perfectly clear um, what that Holy Family was all about and what happened to them. Oh my goodness. So yes, can you tell a bit about how Arthur and Merlin play into the divine birth? Right. So I'll give some hints and tidbits, but it has to do with the story of Arthur's conception, the night that he was conceived by his mother, Egraine. There's a story there that I'll go into in the class that is the absolute clue to the fact that um, Arthur was being conceived through a divine right. Wow. And so, mm -hmm. go ahead. Same with Merlin. We said that Merlin had no father. Right. You see, these are the little signs, and to, at least the Merlin that we know that was associated with Arthur, because I believe that Merlin was a, a, a priest title, okay, that probably went way back, you know, generations and so forth. <clears throat> so, you know, there's also an intrigue about then what happened um, with Guinevere and whether or not she had children. And why not? And that's something I'm going to look at in depth uh, because that is going to tell us something about what was going on under the surface and what the forces uh, were that were trying to foil this sort of um, reappearance of the, of the Christ, Christ Magdalene energy on the planet. Oh my goodness. And that then the veils went down for a very long time after that. And then the British lines were totally corrupted. Oh my goodness. Oh, this yeah. is fascinating. All of this is going to be in your class? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, and it and it really it, it's going to show us how um Arthur and Guinevere are connected to the Christ Sophia consciousness, the Christ Sophia consciousness. And also the fairy consciousness yes. and the Essene consciousness and how all of these things connect. So there are a lot of puzzle pieces coming together now. Various oracles have been receiving this information for a while. I'm putting together the pieces that I know of and the things that I can add about the divine birth aspect and, you know, where we're going as we move forward with these energies, because these are not dead in the water people and groupings, but they still hold medicine for today. And it's like they're reawakening and we are reawakening to them. And so we need some aspect of their medicine uh, in order to help our world in this time of great travail. Did you know that Radiate Wellness is more than just a podcast? That's right. 
We're also a comprehensive holistic wellness practice. Find out about our services, practitioners, and upcoming events at radiatewellnesscommunity.com. While you're there, visit our podcast page to read more about our great guests and even donate to the podcast. If you like our podcast, you can help in other ways as well, like subscribe or follow us wherever you're listening right now. Tell a friend, a family member, or a co-worker about the great content you find here. And if you wouldn't mind, please give us a thumbs up, a five-star rating, or a positive review. Sounds like a small thing, but it really helps. You might like to know about our Facebook communities while we're at it. We have a free community, the Radiate Wellness Community, on Facebook for news and great free content. Our subscribers group is Radiate U, as in the letter U, but also, well, you. There you'll find curated replays of past classes, guest interviews, and more. And now, back to our podcast and back to our guest. Um, I do have a kind of a scientific question, I guess you could say is that the more modern stories of this parthenogenesis, this divine birth, um, have there been studies of the DNA? Yeah. Um, there, there have not been studies, to my knowledge, of the DNA of the, of the women that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but there certainly have been scientific studies about parthenogenesis and it has been induced in certain animals um, by electric shock and chemical means. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. In mice, um, in sea urchins, maybe rabbits as well. Um, there was one experiment that I discussed in my dissertation, which was like the precursor to all my books, um, called Bearing the Holy Ones. That's my dissertation. Mm. And, and, and I mentioned this in The Cult of Divine Birth in Ancient Greece, that book. Um, Jerry Hall, who is, was a um, fertility researcher located in the Los Angeles area, spoke with me. And he, he's done a lot of research on spontaneous conception and things like that. And he instituted a, an experiment by which mice eggs were, um, in, were spurred to reproduce by, I believe it was chemical means. And the zygotes got started and he put them back in the mice mother's wombs. And then the National Institutes of Health got wind of it and told him to shut down the experiment ostensibly because of its um, potential for violating ethics, medical ethics. Oh my gosh. And there have been other articles that I subsequently found um, alluding to his research and cloning and, and things like that. So there's a thing going on here. And um, some people believe that, you know, cloning is, is alive and well. It's been happening for quite some time in secret labs and so forth and so on. I can't comment on that, but um, certainly it, it has been, um, you know, parthenogen medical parthenogenesis has been a focus of attention to some degree in above board laboratory research. Um, I do know that, that there have been moves to create artificial wounds and, you know, it, it start it gets us into the matrix, right? Right. Yeah. It gets us into a weird realm. So this conception power is really sought after. And this is why also um, some of these divine birth priestesses were, would be abducted and taken like Europa, oh. who, um, yeah, Europa was abducted. Helen of Troy, I've discovered, is a divine birth priestess 
And yes, and she was abducted not once but twice. Um, you know, once by Theseus and then and then by um, Paris. And it really, it seems um, in the research that I've done that she was a, a divine birth priestess of Artemis. Oh my goodness. Right. I know. Greek folklore, Greek mythology is full. It's full of these stories. Right. Okay, so... Um, it's just been under the veil of, you know, hypnosis, <laughs> reverse hypnosis, um, uh, along with everything else that would help humanity and that would empower women by virtue of um, the control programs that have been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Right, right. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Well, you know, there are a lot of oracles on the planet, as well as um, whistleblowers and reporters who are aware of what's going on behind the scenes um, regarding the fact that humanity is not alone, that the earth is not alone, that we are a planet visited, inhabited, at times besieged by interdimensional beings. Of, of various stripes and forms, some positive, some negative. Entities, if you will, on the negative side, angels, if you will, on the positive side, and everything in between. And that there has been a long-standing struggle um, for the planet, for the human soul, for human energy, uh, by you know, various of these forces that, that get in and weave themselves into anything that produces energy on the part of the human. Emotions, sexuality, you know, in this case, um, the power of divine birth and, and what, what it can be used for. And these stories are in the Bible. Um, they talk about the watchers who consorted with human women and gave birth to the giants. And this was a, a grave uh, crossing of cosmic law, a great transgression. So, you know, these seemingly outlandish things that I'm saying um, do find validation in various texts uh, that are ancient, as well as the reports of contemporary people. Mm, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, in your book, you have a chapter on Mary's, Mary's childhood training for divine conception. So yeah. she was basically groomed from an early age to do this. That's right. What did this training consist of? Yeah, she was groomed from infancy. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, as I mentioned, she was divinely conceived by her mother, Anne. Right. And so she was already a divine, a, a, a walking representation of the divine on earth, the divine feminine. So she was destined for really, really great things. And her mother, what I describe in the book is that her mother raised her from infancy in her own bedroom shrine. She turned it into a shrine she gave Mary special food. She never let her feet touch the ground. And she had these virgins of the Hebrew temple come in and train her and do various things toward her. And I talk about, you know, uh, with her. And I talk about what some of those might be in the book. And then at a certain point when Mary is three, is two years old, uh, you know, because Anne has made a vow that she will deliver this child to the temple for further raising and training. She proposes it at, when Mary is age two and her consort partner, Joachim, says, no, let's wait a year. And they wait a year. So when Mary is three, she's brought to the temple by the virgins and shows the whole priesthood and Hebrew community what she has learned and she's like a little Dalai Lama. She knows the dance. She knows um, she's very, you know, like a little adult and they all marvel at her. And then she's taken in for further training in the temple. Oh my goodness. 
Mm-hmm. See, and none of that is taught in churches. No, because that is the suppressed, the gospel was suppressed. It was thrown out. It was not considered official or canonical by um, the the various councils that determined what these were. And it went kind of underground as a folk story that fueled a lot of the paintings that a lot of the Renaissance painters did. They did things like Mary's presentation in the temple and, you know, stories about her that were like, what is this? We never heard of this. Um, And um, yeah, so it also was used by the Eastern Orthodox Church, sometimes in liturgies. And, uh, you know, the story was basically held as real, you know, more by the Eastern Orthodox Church than by certainly the Roman Catholic Church. Right. So, you know, but you can find some of these stories in Titian and, uh, you know, some of the stained glass and Anne appears, Joachim appears in some of the stained glass of some of these cathedrals around the world and, you know, it's always like, well, who's Anne? And and she's she's in the lore, Saint Anne. She became Saint Anne, even I think by the Catholic Church. But it's just so weird. You know, they created these feast days of Mary's um, Mary's Mary's birthday of you know you know different things like that. But they didn't pro- provide the scriptural information on which it was based thoroughly confusing people and right you know again turning it into a folklore thing right oh and then having her later you know later the story goes of course that she ascended yes yes and i think that that is in fact something that the roman catholic church kind of got right um it said that she had a dormition and then an assumption so that she never really fully died. And I believe that is correct in that she had an ascension ritual at her death, which I have found information about in her biographies that have also been suppressed. Oh. And I'm going to be working, uh, working on that and writing about that in, in the, next, the next book on Mary. But that um, just like these women and people knew how to do rites for conception. They knew how to do rites for the passage of the soul out of the body, which isn't such an unusual thing. And uh, we hear in the case of Buddhist monks that they would go rainbow body, that they were trained yogically to exit their head, and then there would be rainbow lights appearing above the the dwelling where they were crossing out of their body, that their bodies would completely disappear, you know, all of that type of stuff. Wow. That's Mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, where did these rituals of divine conception come from? Where did they originate? Well, that's a really good question. We do see evidence that virgins gave birth to humanity in the story of the seven sisters of the Pleiades. Mm. They are considered the seven star seed mothers of humanity in the Greek tradition and across the world in many, many indigenous traditions again. So clearly there was some kind of technology going on cross association between star beings and human material DNA. Um, And so, you know, there are also stories in the Gnostic Gospels of Eve conceiving um, in this way, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we find these stories peppered around going, going far back. And then I talk about in the cult of divine birth in ancient Greece, I talk about the ancient archeology span that has these images of like twinning, um, the female that's like a Siamese twin. Mm. And then there's a very old one from like more than 20,000 
BCE, where it looks like a cell dividing, but it looks like one human birthing out of another, but it, it really looks like a parthenogenesis scheme. So it, it seems like, you know, this concept or this capacity goes back deep into humanity's nature. And some say that it may be the original form of birth, that it was more like the human form birthed itself in the way that guppies do or, or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that there wasn't um, sexual union that was needed for the birthing of humanity and that at some point there was, you know, even Plato talks about at some point the sex is divided and that after that, everyone's been searching for their counterpart because of that manipulation, essentially, of the human form. So there are many things we could look to in the archaeological, in the ancient record, in the, in the lore legend, and also in the Akashic records through our own, um, really, you know, receptivity in meditative states, in medicine states, and so forth. I think that once people start putting their attention on this, um, they'll be bringing forth a lot more information. And I have had that experience of, of uh, clients and friends and students who do start tuning into this. And then, you know, they're all, and colleagues, and they're, they're all, you know, revealing um, verification of what I've been saying, or they're adding pieces to it. So it's quite an interesting thing that's going to be unfolding as people begin to metabolize what it is that I'm saying and that I've been metabolizing essentially for for 20 years because I got the four, first downpour that divine birth was a real thing in 2001 I believe mm -hmm. okay right what was your background prior to that prior to doing this well the way it happened is I was in the California Institute of Integral Studies. I was getting my master's degree and I was doing my master's thesis on Demeter and Persephone in Sicily and their mother-daughter story. And I found out through my research, um, this one woman who believed that the Demeter Persephone story was a story of parthenogenesis. So mm. Persephone being divinely born of Demeter, the, the, the mother daughter goddess pair there. Mm -hmm. And I was reading her book in Italian and um, it's like just mystery information just came right into me. I, it was, it was a downpour. I was, I, I stood there and I, I was like, Oh my gosh, virgin birth was real. Okay, and from that memory, <laughs> I went forth into the Greek material because I was studying about priestesses and I wanted to do like the definitive dissertation on anything ever said about priestesses. And <clears throat> so as I started to go into that, with that hypothesis in mind, I found so much information. It was, it was mind boggling. I would I would be so energetically overpowered that sometimes I would just have to lie down on my carpet in my office and um, breathe because it, it was just so much energy coming through me. Oh my goodness. Now, had you grown up Catholic, Christian? Like what was your religious? Yeah, yeah I was raised a good Italian girl in Bronx, New York, and then, you know, Westchester and then Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, I was earnest, you know, I was kind of, I was always trying to find the mystical juice in, in the homilies and so forth. And the only thing that would ever stimulate me would be Mary Magdalene when she, whenever she would be mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, um so, you know, that was always in my mind. I mean, I did kind of have a sense of, of reverence for these figures, for Jesus and Mary and, and Magdalene. And as I 
left all that, you know, rejected it. I, and, and went on my own spiritual journey of discovery and, and really opened, you know, released the veils between myself and interdimensional knowledge. I was able to then go back to this Holy Family story and understand it in a much deeper esoteric way. And, but, you know, it's interesting that it, it wasn't through the Mother Mary story that I came to understand divine birth was a real thing. It was through the Greek tradition. So it's like a lot of my past lives were all converging and my memories were um, allowing me to have that divinely orchestrated moment in 2000, January, 2001. Right. Oh my goodness. Um, so I know you've got this class coming up starting June 15. And what are you planning to teach in that class? What is, why, why are you doing this class? Right. So this class is about helping people make the connections between Jesus, Mary, and the Magdalene, and the, the epic and the personages of Guinevere, Arthur, you know, the other individuals that were associated with them, and the Fae and the Essenes, and how all of this has to do with the, the resurrection of Christ Sophia consciousness mm. in our world and in our individual selves. You know, we're calling it Christ Sophia consciousness. Another tradition might call it something else, but it, it's referring to the same principle, which is the awakening of consciousness, the awareness of the interdimensional nature of reality, the opening and healing of the heart, the healing of the human form, um, the ability to connect back again with the subtle beings, our cousins, uh, the nature spirits on the other side of the veil who who are very much living through the trees and the flowers and the plants, the rocks and the lakes and the mountains, you know, these spirits, we need to bring all of this together in a weave, in a tapestry, so that we can grab our world from the hands of these controllers and, you know, steer the ship in a better direction and this is what our ascension or incension is all about on the planet. It's why there are so many on the planet right now. We've all incarnated in, at this time with the possibility and option that we will have an awakening to the spirit realm authentically. And that we will then understand what we need to do to heal our souls, release our karma from many, many lifetimes, and what we need to do to restore this planet back to its Eden realm. Right. Wonderful. How many weeks does this course run? It runs for four sessions, um, once weekly, you know, four weekly sessions on Wednesdays through July 6th. Mm -hmm. And it runs for an hour and a half, so it's going to be pretty juicy. Um, you know, the modules have to do with uh, looking at Guinevere and Arthur as fairy, looking at Arthur as a divinely born king, right. restoring their sacred marriage template and therefore ours, right. um, understanding about the rise and fall of divine birth in Avalon, and in doing so, reclaiming our inner grail because it's these processes are both outer in the collective and they are inner right. and and toward that end we're also going to be working with the round table technology resurrecting what is that really Ooh. and understanding it as um a tool an inner and outer tool for establishing unity and harmony inside and out as well and then we will be working on um activating our fairy dna which i believe each of us has because they are our ancestors okay and 
activating that DNA is going to be an important part of our raising our consciousness and then coming into both spiritual and ecological consciousness. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And out of your work, you have grown the Seven Sisters Mystery School. Yes. Can you talk about what that yes. is? This is our 10th birthday year. Oh, I think congratulations. Happy yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, literally September 14th, oh 2022 will be the 10th birthday. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah, I started it in 2012. You know, that momentous 2012 when so many people started cracking open and having dark nights of the soul. And, you know, oh, my God. Um, yeah, I was able to get support to sort of weave together all of my academic and esoteric leanings and knowledge into this school and really develop it and move from being a, 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 an academic teacher into an experiential teacher um, with a strong informational component. So I've done lots of classes over the years, many really. I work clairvoyantly, intuitively with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I've offered oracle trainings and courses on how to connect with the fairies and um, you know it's it's been something new every practically every quarter of the past 10 years there are lots of uh, blog posts that i've done free offerings so people can go to seven sisters mystery school.com and take a look lots there there is lots there yeah i'm looking at it now there's your your all of your events your online courses talking about enrolling the reclaiming guinevere arthur the Fay and the Round Table, your private sessions, um, your lots of free resources. Yeah. Um, there's a section for men on sh shamanic power and shamanic tools. There's your store. Um, you've written several books, actually. And we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg with that, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was like a little taster for, you know, if people get the new book, The Mystery Tradition of Miraculous Conception, it, the first chapter of it kind of consolidates and summarizes in a very readable, digestible form what is in um, those other two books to a large degree. So that's that's a good place for people to start. And then if they really like to dig into more academic feeling and sounding books, they can go back to those first two, um, The Cult of Divine Birth in Ancient Greece and Virgin Mother Goddesses of Antiquity. Gosh, that sounds so exciting, all of your books. Um, you. Is there anything you think we haven't talked about, anything you'd like to go back and, and touch on again, or anything you feel like we, we've not mentioned? You know, oh gosh, I mean, obviously, Christy, these topics are fathomless, right? And so much has been written and so much could be said about them. Um, I feel like we've given people a real good taster, you know, a little tapas plate, if you will, <laughs> of, of things they can go back to my site or books about and dig in deeper or get, you know, the main course of it. Um, yeah, uh, it, it feels, it feels really complete. I just welcome people to visit our site and, and contact us or me at dove, D-O-V-E, at sevensistersofferings.com. And the seven is always written out in our URL and then the email, S-E-V-E-N. Um, yeah, if they want to find out more or, um, connect and, and so forth. Yeah. So that's Dove at Seven Sisters Offering. Offerings, plural. Um, Offerings, plural, dot com. Yeah. We'll put all of this information in the show notes. Yeah. And the, the website is Seven Sisters Mystery School dot com. Correct. And I think just the last thing I'd say is, you know, understanding that yeah, you and I have been radiating Mary's love energy. Yeah. Um, and that's ultimately what it's all about. Yeah. It's not even about history. It's not even about concepts. It's about growing as, as a being of love. Yeah. And 
That's what's going to get us through. That's what's going to get us to the next steps. And that's what's going to make life sweet and much, much better because there's so much healing that needs to happen on the planet. And it, it really starts with the love energy. Right. That divine mother love. That's right. Right. Mary being the OG teen mother. 